What's up guys, hope you're having a good day. In this video, I'm going to be breaking down all of the main card fights from UFC 261 from a betting perspective. Hopefully, you'll be able to use the information in this video to make better betting decisions, build better DraftKings lineups, and hopefully earn some extra cash. And if you'd like to watch breakdown videos and analysis for all the other fights taking place on this card, head on over to my website, MMABettingTips.com. I'll leave a link to it in the description below. On there, you'll find breakdown videos for all the fights taking place this weekend, as well as a wide range of bets, over-unders, prop bets, traditional pre-fight bets. You'll find them all on there, as well as a VIP chat room. I think you're going to like it. And on that note, because this is such a big card this weekend, we've also got a few extra spaces available in our live betting group. If you watch these videos regularly, you'll know these spaces don't come up very, very often. We do have a few spaces available, so if you'd like to join us for live betting this week, go to my website, link in the description below, head to betting tips, live betting tips, you can sign up from there, you'll absolutely love it, I feel very confident in that. But now, it is the stage in the video where we need to do a business deal. So last week, we didn't hit the like target on the videos, there was no prop bet live stream, but I really, really, really want to do a prop bet live stream this week, so you already know what to do, hit the like button below, but this week, we do have a problem. So usually I would do a prop bet live stream on Saturday night. But this week, I'm booked in to have my COVID vaccine at 7.30pm. Which is kind of crazy when you think about it. Like to go for a COVID vaccine at 7.30 on a Saturday night is nuts. But in the UK, they're going hard on this vaccination program. And you don't actually get to choose when you're going to have your vaccine. They just send you a letter. Say go to this place at this time. And you have to basically turn up and have your vaccine. So... This weekend, I'm probably going to be a little bit messed up from the COVID vaccine. I hear that you know people that have it can be a little bit beat up, get a little bit of sick. They don't feel too good after having the vaccine, which is tricky because obviously I'm having it at 7.30 p.m. And then I got a live bet at 11.30 p.m. But you know what? The bookies need all the help they can get because we fucking destroy them when it comes to live betting. So... This fucking vaccine had better hit me hard, because if it doesn't, I'm still going to punch the bookies in the dick. And Denise Coates, I know you don't even have a dick, but you can get it as well. So, nothing's going to stop me this weekend. However, the problem with having this vaccine on Saturday night means I can't do a prop bet live stream on Saturday, but I can do it on Friday night. So, this video gets 300 likes by Friday night. I can't be hitting that target on Saturday, because I've got to have the vaccine this video gets 300 likes by Friday, which should be very easy to do. You know, the prop bet live streams, they get over a thousand views. These videos get multiple thousand views. 300 likes is nothing. If you want that prop bet live stream, hit the like button below and we'll get it popping on Friday night after the weigh-ins. All right, so we can talk about the weigh-ins and shit as well. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun. Let's do it, boys. Anyway, with that, let's get into the first fight that I want to talk about in today's video, which is going to be Anthony Smith against Jim Crute. So these are two fighters that are very obviously on completely opposite career trajectories. Even though Anthony Smith is only, even though Anthony Smith is only 32 years old, which isn't at all you know old for a light heavyweight, he is showing signs of being on quite a steep decline. And I guess it's no surprise, he's had 50 pro fights, which is a hell of a lot of time spent, you know, in, in, you know, in the octagon. You know, I know he hasn't competed in the UFC his whole career, but the point I'm trying to make is Anthony Smith has spent a lot of time, you know, in competitive fights, taking a lot of damage. That's obviously had a big wear and tear on his body, and now we're starting to see signs of all that damage, all that wear and tear add up over the years, and he's just not the same guy that he used to be. Jim Crute, on the other hand, is only 25 years old. He's going to be making big improvements from fight to fight. He's very, very early on in his career with only 13 pro fights under his belt. And so both guys, very different career trajectories, right? Smith on the way down, Crute on the way up, which is what makes this a super interesting matchup because this is a young man's game, a young man's sport, right? Youth is very, very important. And Crute has looked absolutely phenomenal lately. It's very, very difficult to form a super strong opinion on this matchup because as we can see, uh, you know, Crute went into the third round, almost went the distance against Paul Craig in his UFC debut all the way back in 2018. But since then, every single one of his fights has ended in round one. So, you know, when you look at the Jim Crute versus Paul Craig fight, there's a lot for us to talk about in that matchup. A lot of weaknesses, a lot of things that I didn't like about Crute. But I don't want to be too harsh on Crute for weaknesses that he demonstrated against Paul Craig. 
because it was his debut. Obviously, bright lights of the UFC, a lot of pressure to perform in your debut. And he was only 22, 23 years old back then. And, you know, at this stage in a fighter's career, they're, they're sponges. Crute is going to be making exponential gains from fight to fight. So this one's tricky to form a strong opinion on because it's been, a you know, it's been a long time since we saw Crute go past the first round. Um... You know, and, and there were a lot of weaknesses in that Craig fight, which I feel Smith can exploit. But I don't want to be too harsh on Croup for them, because like I say, it was a long time ago. He's probably improved a lot since then. So let's let's delve into the odds and try and work this one out from a betting point of view. So if we look at the average odds on Jim Croot at the moment, currently around about an average of 1.52, which is minus 192 for an implied probability of 66%. And if we take a look at the odds on Anthony Smith, he is currently around about an average of 2.60, which is plus 160 for an implied probability of 38%. And this really just shows how fast things can change in MMA because it wasn't that long ago that Anthony Smith was fighting for the title. He was in the title picture. He was the main event on Fight Night cards. And now he is a pretty decent sized underdog to a relatively unproven fighter. Jim Crute has looked very, very good. But obviously hasn't really picked up, uh, you know, wins over anyone notable. And there are weaknesses in Crute's style, which I do think could get him into a lot of trouble here. When we look at Anthony Smith, we know that he's a big, tall, long dude, right? He used to fight a middleweight, but he was a huge middleweight and he's also a huge light heavyweight. He's got, you know, a 76 inch reach and he's six foot four. That will give him a significant four inch reach advantage over Crute. Crute is very unlucky in that, you know, Mother Nature hasn't been kind to him. He has an abnormally short reach for the division, a 72-inch reach to put into perspective for you how short that is for a light heavyweight. You'd usually see that kind of reach in the lightweight or featherweight division. So Crute has been blessed with a very bad case of T-Rex arms here. However, the silver lining is that Smith doesn't use his length very well, so probably not going to be that much of an issue. And that actually brings us on to how these guys match up from a striking point of view. One of the issues that we find with guys that are abnormally long and tall for the division, whichever division they're in, doesn't matter if they're a strawweight or a heavyweight, you know, you think about a Stefan Struve, um, you know, they, they, they're quite often quite slow, quite sluggish, quite cumbersome. They don't move particularly well. And Anthony Smith has a lot of those weaknesses. At six foot four, he's just very slow you know, very slow in his movement, very slow to react to his opponent. And defensively, he's not great. At times, it looks like Anthony Smith is fighting underwater. And if the fight stays standing, which I don't think he will, but if the fight stays standing, that does give Jim Crute quite a big advantage. You know, Smith is dangerous, don't get me wrong, but Crute has a massive speed and power advantage over Smith. You know, when it comes to boxing, Crute, you know, commits much harder to his power punches, sits down much harder, he's much faster, he's much more accurate. Crute is just much more dangerous with his boxing. But Crute does have a predominantly kicks-based style of striking. And, you know, that's one of the reasons why Crute's short reach doesn't hold him back as much. Because Crute's, you know, main weapon are his kicks. And he's got fantastic body kicks, great head kicks, which obviously won't be easy to land on a, on a tall opponent like Smith. Because he's six foot four, not easy to head kick someone that tall. But one of Jimmy Crute's best weapons are his leg kicks. He's able to land them from very, very far outside of his opponent's range. He sets them up very nicely, hammers his opponent's legs, and that is one particular technique that Anthony Smith is very, very susceptible to. Smith stands very heavy on the lead leg, and because he's so long and tall, he's got you know really long, skinny legs, which you know a big, strong, powerful, physically imposing dude like Crute can chop down. And ironically. Uh, you know, early on, if you go back and watch Anthony Smith's fight against Alexander Rakic, Rakic actually did drop Anthony Smith with leg kicks. It's a technique Smith's particularly vulnerable to, and it's something that Jim Croup does very, very well. But with how these two guys match up, I would expect this to go to the ground. Anthony Smith has a base in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He likes to be on the ground. He likes to be on his back. We've seen that in his last three fights against Glover, Rakic, and Clark, where... You know, when he's been taken down by Rakic, Glover and Clark, he hasn't made too much of an effort to work his way back up to his feet. He's quite happy to play around on the ground. And Jim Croup also primarily has a base in grappling. Partly, I think, because he trains at a predominantly grappling-based gym under Dan Kelly. 
But what's a little bit annoying about that is that I actually think Jim Crute's striking is a lot better than his grappling. I think he does get himself into trouble a lot on the ground. And if he really focused on using his grappling in reverse to keep this fight standing, he'd be a much safer bet at the current odds. So how do these guys match up from a stylistic point of view? Uh, on the ground at least. Well, on the ground, both of them are kind of similar in some ways, but very different in others. The way that they're similar is that they're both very good at being the hammer and not so good at being the nail. And what I mean by that is when Anthony Smith and Jim Crute are in control of the grappling positions, trying to take their opponent down, trying to work from top position, and when they're in control, they're very, very good. But both Anthony Smith and Jim Crute share the same weakness in that they have very, very bad takedown defense and they're very weak off their back. If you want to see a little bit of that for yourself, you don't have to look very far. All you need to do is go check out Smith's fight against Rakic and Glover to see both Rakic and Glover rack up a lot of top control on the ground. If you look at Jim Crute's fights, if you just check out his matchup against Misha Sirkinov and Paul Craig, again, you'll see Crute looking really, really weak on the ground. So when you have two fighters that very, very weak off their back, but are likely to want to go to the ground. You're really left asking yourself the question, you know, who's more likely to initiate grappling exchanges and get the fight to the ground, right? Because, you know, realistically, the person shooting takedowns, the person trying to get the fight to the ground is usually going to be the person that ends up on top. And absolutely no doubt about it, that that is Jim Crute. If you look at Jim Crute's last uh, three fights against Medeskis, Bukowskis, Mikhail Alexejic and Misha Sirkinov, in every single one of those fights, he's come out with a grappling heavy game plan and looked to drag his opponent to the ground. And with Crew coming from a predominantly grappling based gym, training under Dan Kelly, with him having so much success with his grappling in the majority of his fights, right? He's won by submission in three of his five fights in the UFC. And with Anthony Smith looking so weak off his back against Glover and Rakic, I feel the blueprint, blueprint has already been written on how to beat Anthony Smith. And I think Crew. Primarily being a grappler under the guidance of Dan Kelly will fancy his chances of taking Smith to the ground and giving him hell on the ground. Now, if this fight goes to the ground, both guys are you know, very different grapplers. Anthony Smith is one of these fighters that very much relies on technique. And this is why he does sometimes struggle when he's on his back because... Anthony Smith has got, you know, a decent, you know, decent level in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. Not a super high level Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, but he's a decent grappler. But because Smith lacks physicality and strength on the ground, he doesn't have that physical aspect to his grappling. Stronger guys from top position are quite easily able to neutralize what Smith is trying to do off his back. And the Glover... And uh, the Glover and Rakic fights are really good examples of this. Rakic probably in particular. You know, we know Glover is an ultra high level Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. You know, we know Glover is difficult to deal with when he's on top of you. But Alexander Rakic, not so much, right? Rakic has got that base in kickboxing. And you wouldn't expect a, a kickboxer like Rakic to cause Anthony Smith so much trouble on the ground. And yet Rakic dominated Smith from top position. And that was because... Because Rakic had so much more physicality to his style of grappling, he was so much bigger and stronger. Every time Anthony Smith tried to get something going off his back with either an armbar attempt or a triangle attempt, Rakic was able to just shut it down, neutralize it, power out of it, and Smith wasn't able, you know, what wasn't able to get near anything. Jim Crute very, very much has that physicality to his grappling. Crute's tech, you know, Crute's technique on the ground is okay. But a lot of what Krupp does well on the ground comes from his power, it, you know, his physicality. And those kind of fighters have been the kind of fighters who have caused Smith a problem because they can kind of overwhelm him with power and then Smith can't use his, his technical advantages on the ground. But it's not all rosy when it comes to Jim Krupp because he is only 25 years old and... If you go back and watch his fights against Misha Sirkinov and Paul Craig in particular, because he's very raw, because he's very green, because he's you know very much still learning, there are big mistakes that he makes on the ground. You know he will often give up position, hunting long shot submissions. He will get aggressive on back takes and things like that, and lose top position. And Crew is a guy 
that can get himself into trouble. He repeatedly gave up top position against Paul Craig, and I don't want to dwell on that for you know reasons I covered earlier on. It was a long time ago. I'm sure Crute has improved a lot since that fight. But one thing you're going to hear me say a lot throughout this video, particularly with the Rose and Zhang fight, is I, I'm not one of these guys that's going to speculate on how fighters are going to perform. I'm going to research their past fights, and I'm going to tell you exactly what I see in the footage. And in the footage we've got available on Crute, he does make a lot of mistakes on the ground, which could get him into trouble against a much more experienced grappler in Anthony Smith. So, from my perspective, I definitely lean Jim Crute here. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But if I'm going to bet a guy, you know, at an implied probability of about 66%, I don't want them to have any major red flags because... You know, if you're, you, you've got to put up $100, right, just to win $50 profit. You know, it's not the best risk-to-reward ratio. You want a guy in this odds range to be a very, very safe bet. They can't have any major weaknesses that their opponent could exploit. And unfortunately, I don't see that in Crute. His takedown offense is bad. He does make a lot of mistakes on the ground. And while he has improved a lot since he, you know, he, 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 while he's probably, it's, it's, it's an assumption, while he's probably improved a lot since he fought Paul Craig, because his last four fights have ended so quickly, we haven't really had a chance to see it. And what I can tell you is that if Jim Crute does show up and perform like he did against Paul Craig, he could struggle quite bad against Anthony Smith. Now, because of how dangerous Crute is standing, because of how physically imposing he is on the ground, there's no way I would bet Smith here. Smith is not at all appealing to me as an underdog. But at the same time, there's a little bit too much risk for me to take a bet on Crute. And so for that reason, uh, I'm going to pass on this fight. Sorry to be boring, but I hope you found that useful. Let's talk about the fight between Chris Whiteman and Uriah Hall. So... This is one of those interesting matchups because both of the guys in this fight are in that even money odds range. We've got Chris Whiteman as a slight favourite at about 1.80, which is minus 125 for an implied probability of 56%. And if we take a look at the odds on Uriah Hall, he's currently around about an average of 2.0, which is plus 100 for an implied probability of 50%. And you guys know me. I love to research fights in this even money odds range because with both guys, you know, in that implied probability range of about 50%, if you can just lean 60-40 one way or the other, you can find a strong position to put your cash, you can find a good value bet. So I love delving into these fights because usually you can lean one way or the other, which means usually, you know, you can find a bet on these kind of matchups. And that's why if you're a member of my website, MMABettingTips.com, you will know that the lab experiment we've been running on these even money bets has been performing extremely well. And uh, obviously we've been scouting for an even money pick on this fight too, which obviously I will share with you now. So, how do these guys match up? So, straight away, if you know anything about MMA, it's going to be very obvious to you that this is a classic striker versus grappler matchup, right? Chris Whiteman, former NCAA Division I level wrestler, strong grappler, and Uriah Hall has that base in kickboxing. So when we're trying to evaluate who is the stronger side to be on, the really the only question we need to ask is, can Whiteman get this fight to the ground and can he keep the fight on the ground? Because we know Whiteman's going to have the advantage on the ground being the grappler, Hall's going to have the advantage standing being the striker. And that is quite a tricky question to answer and I think it really depends on what version of Chris Whiteman turns up on Saturday night. We were just talking about how Anthony Smith is quite clearly on a very steep decline. And even though, you know, Whiteman hasn't got any, uh, you know, hasn't got as many miles on the clock. He's only had 20 pro fights. He's 36 years old. You know, Anthony Smith has had 50 pro fights, right? Over double. Even though Whiteman hasn't really got as many miles on the clock. He has been in, in, in a few wars, right? Took a life-changing amount of damage against Luke Rockhold. You know, brutally knocked out against Jackery, brutally knocked out against Reyes. And I think we're starting to see all that damage add up. You know, he took a lot of damage against Joel Romero, a lot of damage against Gegard Mousasi. You know, the head trauma, all those wars, those injuries, they do look like they're starting to take their toll on Chris Whiteman. And in his last fight against Omari Akhmedov, he looked an absolute shell of himself. One of the things that I find really useful about research in MMA fights is having a good understanding of, you know, all different fighters, right? So that when 
you know, the fighter you're researching goes up against an opponent that you're studying them against, you're very aware of what that opponent's strengths and weaknesses are, so you can gauge how much success Chris Whiteman has. And Omari Akhmedov is one of these fighters that very much misleads people. The average MMA fan, when they see someone that looks like Omari Akhmedov, you know, that Dagestani appearance, the Dagestani beard they seize from Russia, they automatically assume that Omari Akhmedov is a very skilled, very dangerous fighter. But Akhmedov is one of those anomalies that doesn't really share too many of the characteristics that define most fighters that come out of Dagestan because his gas tank is quite poor. He slows down a lot as the fight goes on. His takedown offense is also pretty poor, and he's very, very weak off their back, off his back. So to the naked eye, you know, a win for Chris Whiteman over someone like Omari Akhmedov can look very impressive on paper. But when you understand the limitations of Omari Akhmedov's skill set, you can see that a win for Whiteman over Akhmedov doesn't mean that much. You know, I would have expected, uh, you know, a former middleweight champion an NCAA Division I level wrestler that absolutely run through Akhmedov and instead Chris Whiteman barely scraped by and looked extremely average and extremely poor. This performance was red flag city for me and I'm pretty confident in saying that if this version of Whiteman shows up and performs uh, you know, on, on, on Saturday night against Uriah Hall, Uriah Hall is going to knock him out real bad. It's going to be ugly. It was a dreadful performance from Whiteman. Very, very, very bad. But this is tricky because that's the first time that we've ever seen Whiteman look that bad. You know, yes, Whiteman's been on a decline for a while. But if you go back and watch the fight against Akhmedov, Whiteman was taking huge, deep, visible breaths towards the end of the first round. It was clear he was slowing down. And he just didn't have any drive or physicality to his grappling. He was shooting takedown attempts way too high above Akhmedov's hips. And just, just, just overall very, very flat. Looked terrible in the second and third round. But that was the first time we've ever seen Whiteman look really flat like that. If you go back and watch his matchups against Jackery and Gaslam, he looked a lot sharper. But obviously, there's almost a two-year gap in between the Jackery and Akhmedov fights. So we don't know how much Whiteman has declined in that time. There are a couple of reasons why Whiteman may have looked bad against Akhmedov, though. He obviously, you know, flirted with moving up to light heavyweight. You know, he'd fought middleweight his entire career, moved up to light heavyweight against Dominic Reyes, got beat, and then dropped back down to middleweight against Akhmedov. So who knows what kind of changes his body were going through. It was also his first fight back after a brutal knockout against Dominic Reyes. We often talk about how really bad knockouts could take a long time for a fighter to get over. So, you know, that's another factor that could play into a poor performance from Whiteman against Akhmedov. Um, and on top of that, this fight took place during COVID, you know, August 2020, right, during the height of COVID in the summer where there was so much uncertainty in the world. And obviously, Chris Whiteman lives and trains in New York. New York was on total lockdown, uh, you know, during August of 2020. And so big shout out to one of the members on my website, Brett, who, who, who brought up that point. You know, I hadn't even thought about it. We were kind of really critical over Omari Akhmedov in the group research session for this fight. And then Brett said, you know, maybe we could cut him some slack. It can't have been easy for Whiteman to train in New York, you know, during the height of the pandemic. And I think Brett was saying he watched an interview with Whiteman where Whiteman spoke about this himself, how difficult it was to get in good training and, and have good training partners, which makes perfect sense. So, you know, when we look at this matchup this weekend against Uriah Hall, it's very, very difficult to gauge how it's going to play out because if Whiteman shows up and performs like he did against Akhmedov, I think Hall smokes him. But if he shows up and performs like he did against Gaslam and Jackery, it could be a lot closer. Um, and that's what makes this one difficult. Did Whiteman look bad because, you know, it's just that, 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 that downward trajectory, that natural decline that he's on at the moment, or did he look bad because the X factors we just mentioned? We don't really know, and we're going to have to wait until this weekend to get our answer. So if we look at Uriah Hall, obviously, you know, one of the things that's plagued Uriah Hall throughout his career has been bad fight IQ, right? He's very difficult to trust. You often feel like he's holding back. He was incredibly gun-shy in his last fight against Anderson Silva, and Uriah Hall is one of these guys that can be very passive, very tentative at times, and one of these guys that if you bet on him, you're quite often left shouting at your TV, begging him to do something because he just lets rounds slip away from him through inactivity. 
And Uriah Hall is a very, very tricky fighter to work out because, you know, similar to Kevin Holland, you never really know what you're going to get from him. When I look at Uriah Hall, I could tell you that he's got absolutely all the skills that he needs to beat Chris Whiteman. His takedown defense is pretty good. Hall has great balance, great athleticism, and he's able to use his striking, you know, use his ability to read his opponent's movement in reverse to spot when they're about to change levels and shoot takedowns. Uriah Hall is very, very good at, you know, clearing his legs from the takedown, getting his back over to the cage and using the cage as a base to defend the takedown. Very, very difficult to take down. Digs under hooks early, has great balance. Hall's takedown offense is solid. So then you're probably wondering why we've seen Hall struggle on the ground so many times, right? If he's so difficult to take down, why does he keep ending up on the ground? And really, it comes down to complacency and a lack of concentration. His last, fi his last fight against... Uh, not his last fight, sorry, but one of his recent fights against Antonio Carlos Jr. demonstrates the the both the strengths and the weaknesses in Uriah Hall's takedown defense against uh, you know Carlos Jr. There are moments where Uriah Hall's takedown defense looks absolutely bulletproof. Carlos Jr. will shoot beautifully timed deep double leg takedowns. He'd get in very very deep on the legs of Hall, and then Hall would do an absolutely brilliant job of clearing his legs, getting under hooks in plate, and stuffing the takedown. And you look at those clips of Hall, and you think, you know what? This guy's takedown offense is rock solid. It's going to be difficult for a guy like Whiteman to take him down. You know, you want to bet Hall. But then there are other moments in the in the Carlos Jr. fight where Hall gets complacent. He takes his eye off the ball. He has these lapses in concentration where he just gives up a weak takedown out of absolutely nowhere. And there's no reason for it other than he wasn't concentrating. The best way I can describe it is it's almost like Hull has some kind of self-destruct mentality where he does the hard work, but then complacency gets the better of him and he makes small mistakes. I guess the point I'm trying to make is if you're asking me based on where both guys are at in their career, because someone said in the live stream, how can you say that how can you basically say that shoe faces uh, offensive wrestling is comparable to Chris Whiteman? Because obviously shoe face has a base in BJJ, and Chris Whiteman has a you know he's a former NCAA Division One level wrestler. They said surely you know Whiteman's wrestling is going to give Hall more trouble than shoe face, and no, that's not correct because at this stage in their careers, shoe face is a better offensive wrestler. And of course, if you go back three or four years. Whiteman would have fucking wrestled Shoe Face to death. Much better offensive wrestler back then, but with a de decline that Whiteman's on, doesn't have the same level of os offensive wrestling he used to. And so now, you know, in terms of who's got more drive, who's got better timing, you know, who's got more physicality on their on their takedown entries, it's definitely Shoe Face. And so, if Hall can neutralize Shoe Face's offensive wrestling for the most part, pretty good chance he can cause Whiteman, Whiteman big problems. But the reason why this becomes a very difficult matchup uh, to call is because Hall 100% has the takedown offense to keep the fight standing, but he just switches off, loses concentration, and gives up weak takedowns out of nowhere, which means it's tough to trust him. What I can say, though, is Whiteman has shown a very, very, very steep decline in terms of striking, right? They say when you start to decline, your reflexes are one of the first things to go. And I could tell you the Whiteman just doesn't see the shots coming in the same way that he used to. Uh, if you go back and watch his fight against Ronaldo Jacare Souza, this is probably the best fight to illustrate this. Go back, watch that matchup, and watch Jacare repeatedly land the right hand over and over and over and over again. He repeatedly landed the right hook over and over and over again on Whiteman. Whiteman didn't see it coming. Didn't make any adjustments, and it was eventually the the, the right hand from Jackery that knocked him out in the third round. So obviously Uriah Hall's much faster, much more accurate, you know, much more unorthodox. He's far more difficult to read than Jackery, and the shots to knock you out are the ones you see coming. And so if this fight does stay standing, with how vulnerable Whiteman has looked, with how bad his boxing defense has looked, he is going to be a sitting duck to that knockout. So. Based on everything that I've just said, I am a firm believer that when fighters you know, get into the tail end of their career, 
and they have a bad performance, it's much more likely that they're on a decline and they're not going to be able to turn that around. They're just going to you know, get worse and worse and worse as their body and mind continues to decline. And so you know, when I look at a fighter like Whiteman, I can't be 100% sure that he's on a massive decline and he's going to look exactly like he did against Akhmedov on Saturday night. But until Whiteman shows me differently... I've got to go with my mantra of you are only as good as your last fight. You know, if it was someone like Bryce Mitchell, you know, or Kay Hansen, very, very young in their career, and they had an off night, you know, I, I would let it go. I would say, you know what, probably just an off night, um, just a bad night, a bad weight cut. Maybe they were sick or something. You, you could kind of turn a blind eye. But in Weidman's situation, when you see them put in such a, a, a bad, sloppy, flat performance against someone like Akhmedov, it's alarm bells, man. It's red flag city. So from my perspective, you know, it does look like Whiteman's on a very steep decline. I think if he shows up and performs like he did against that Medov, very, very high probability Uriah Hall knocks him out. But with how bad Uriah Hall's fight IQ is, um, you know, Whiteman probably can get him to the ground and probably can cause him trouble on the ground. The question is, for how long? Because by the second round against Akhmedov, Whiteman was was absolutely gassed out of his mind and, and lacked any kind of physicality with his wrestling. So I am going to lean towards Hall here. I wouldn't bet him because it's a very, very risky bet. Essentially, you're betting on a coin flip. However, um, you know, if gun to head, if you do want to bet this fight, you've got to go with Hall. So I hope you found that useful. Now, let's talk about the fight between Valentina Shevchenko and Jessica Andrade. So, when we look at the odds on this one, Valentina Shevchenko is obviously one of the biggest favourites on the entire card. Currently around about a 1.24 favourite, which is minus 417 for an implied probability of 81%. And if we take a look at the odds on Jessica Andrade, she is currently around about an average of 4.25, which is plus 325 for an implied probability of 24%. So, when we look at the odds on Valentina Shevchenko, whenever you see a fighter in this odds range, you know, commanding an implied probability of 81%, you've got to give them a better than 81% chance of winning in order to find any value over the bookie. And it is very, very difficult to do that in MMA because of the amount of different ways that a fighter can win or lose. If we just take, you know, Valentina Shevchenko's advantages out of the equation... Think about all the crazy shit we've seen happen on UFC events over the last few weeks. You know, technical decisions, disqualifications. You know, there are ways that Shevchenko can lose even if she may be the better fighter, right? She might get disqualified throwing an illegal strike. Uh, you know, she may get cut with something crazy like a glancing blow or something and, and lose via doctor stoppage. She might get injured in the fight. She might go into a fight injured. She might have a bad weight cut. She might get sick. It's very, very difficult to find value in this odds range. So what I always say to people is in order to bet a fighter in this odds range, they literally do have to be Robocop. They have to be pretty much indestructible, have to have pretty much no way to lose. And when you're researching this fight between Valentina Shevchenko and Jessica Andrade, if you want to bet Valentina Shevchenko, that's really what you've got to focus on. I want to make that very, very clear because I will obviously be talking about some of the ways that I believe Andrade can cause Shevchenko trouble. But make no mistake, I'm not deluded enough to realize that this is a very, 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 very difficult fight for Jessica Andrade. It's like the worst stylistic matchup for Andrade possible. Because we know that Jessica Andrade comes into every single matchup with the same strategy. She's very easy to game plan for. She's got the same style that she uses in every single matchup and doesn't really mix things up. We know Andrade is going to look to come forward, hands down low, chin up high, wing in those big wide hooks. She might shoot the occasional takedown, but for the most part, she's going to look to come forward, force Valentina to fight in that uncomfortable range and look to load up on those big hooks that she likes to throw to the body and head. The major, major, major problem with Jessica Andrade is that she has very, very bad boxing defense. She shows absolutely no respect, you know, to her opponents at all and just comes forward and, and, you know, tries to get in their face, rough them up and force them to fight, you know, in a state of panic and put them on the back foot. Now, 
for the most part, that has been a very successful strategy for Jessica Andrade. She started her career in the UFC in the bantamweight division. She then dropped down to strawweight. And because she's such a big, strong, powerful, physically imposing fighter, she can walk through the shots of the majority of strawweights. You know, the majority of strawweights lack the power in their hands to hurt her. And that's what makes her so formidable. That's why she can get away with having this very one-dimensional style. Because even though you know exactly what to expect from Andrade and you know how to game plan for Andrade, trying to actually deal with it is, 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 is very, very difficult because of how much physicality she has compared to other strawweights in the division. But... We saw against Wei Lei Zhang how much that style can get her into trouble, right? She came forward very, very recklessly against Zhang, walked onto a huge right hook, got dropped, and obviously, you know, the fight ended shortly after. I think when you look at the power that Zhang has in her hands, it's a reminder that even though Andrade has looked like an absolute destroyer in the strawweight division, her style won't be as effective as she starts to face girls that have got the power in their hands to punish her. And we know Valentina Shevchenko absolutely has the power in her hands to hurt her. Valentina Shevchenko is an absolute sniper. You know, ruthlessly accurate. Very, very fast hands. She has a very diverse, wide range of strikes. And she's also a southpaw, which makes this an even more difficult fight for Andrade. Andrade likes to maraud forward from that orthodox stance. But with Shevchenko liking to fight southpaw... The southpaw versus orthodox dynamic means that these two girls are going to be fighting in that open striking stance, which means Nunes is going to be walking right under the power left kick of Shevchenko and also the power left hand. So it's, 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 it's a real tricky stylistic matchup for Andrade because Shevchenko has the accuracy and the style of striking to really punish Andrade for her bad defense and her recklessness. Now... A lot of people will be talking about how Andrade will be very small compared to Valentina. You know, Andrade is five foot one with a sixty-two inch reach. Uh, Valentina five foot five with a sixty-five inch reach. So Shevchenko will be bigger than Andrade. There's no getting away from that. But I don't think size is going to play too much of a factor in this matchup because realistically, Shevchenko is quite small for the flyweight division. You know, a lot of the girls, the majority of girls that compete at straw weight that Andrade has been fighting at straw weight do have a similar wingspan to Shevchenko. It's not like Shevchenko is a big flyweight. And so I don't think in terms of, you know, reach and height, that's going to throw Andrade off. Andrade is very used to competing against girls of a similar size to Shevchenko. I don't see that being a big deal, but... I do think the power and physicality of Shevchenko will be very different. We've already spoken about how, you know, there's a big difference from getting caught with a clean right hand from someone like Shevchenko compared to getting caught with a clean right hand from someone like Tisha Torres, right? Different levels of power. And on top of that, we've also seen Shevchenko demonstrate the difference between the strawweight division and the flyweight division in the past. If you go back and watch Shevchenko's fight against Joanna and Jacek, you'll see that the naked eye, in terms of strikes landed, is actually a very competitive fight. Both girls went back and forth. Joanna held her own. But the difference was, when Jacek would open up and land on Shevchenko, the, 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 you know, and Jacek just wouldn't be able to hurt Shevchenko. She had no power in her hands, just wasn't able to back Shevchenko up or get any respect in the octagon with her striking. And yet when Shevchenko would land on Jan Jacek, you'd see Jan Jacek get her head snap back, you know, fly back a couple of feet and really struggle to deal with the physicality of Shevchenko. So that matchup is a really good visual you know, representation of, you know, how, how you can take shots from straw weights, but it's a lot difficult to take those same kind of shots from, from fly weights. However... I did allude just a few moments ago to the fact that I don't think, you know, the height and reach is going to be a major advantage here because Andrade is smaller than everyone, right? At five foot one, she is one of the smallest fighters in the UFC by wingspan. But we know she's got that small, muscular, athletic, compact style. 
And with that comes, you know, that farm girl strength that people talk about, that strong core, that athleticism. She's an absolute powerhouse. And what's interesting is in Rose Namajunas' interview with Ariel Helwani this week, she said something very interesting about this fight when Ariel asked her who she thought would win. Because obviously Rose has trained with Valentina and she's fought Andrade. Now listen to what she's got to say. I find this very interesting. And it's kind of funny. Once again, you're somewhat linked to Jessica because she's on the card as well fighting for the 125 title. How do you think she'll do against Valentina? Um, that's pretty interesting. I think they both have, you know, opportunities, uh, opportunities to, to um, expose each other. As long as Valentina just has to make sure that she doesn't sleep on her. And, you know, I think, I think that, um, you know, she, man, it's, it's tough to say because, uh, all it takes for Andres is just to connect one time and mm. it's total, like, I've never been hit like that before. So, oh. <laughs> and I've trained, I trained with Valentina and she, and Valentina has some serious power as well, but, um, Andres is different. Um, I think if, uh, so Andres could put a chink in Valentina's armor, but that's really hard to find on her. Mm. So I thought that was pretty interesting because we know Andrade is big, powerful, physically imposing. She hits very, very hard in the strawweight division. And it was just kind of interesting to hear straight from the horse's mouth that, you know, Namajuna, someone that's trained a lot with Shevchenko, she's fought Andrade twice, is saying that Andrade just hits very different. And so where we're talking about how there's much more danger for Andrade in this fight because Shevchenko has the power to hurt Andrade in the way many of Andrade's past opponents haven't. What's interesting, you know, based on what Rose said, is it appears Andrade may have the power to hurt Shevchenko in ways that Shevchenko hasn't been hurt in the past, certainly not since she fought Amanda Nunes. You know, you look at girls like Jessica I, Chukajan, Jennifer Meyer, you know, even Joanny and Jacek, they're all more volume strikers. They don't have that, you know, big marauding one-shot power that can really hurt you and so it's just very interesting to hear Rose say that but if the fight stays standing you know if you ever watch Shevchenko or Andrade fight it doesn't take a rocket scientist to work out how this is likely to play out you know Andrade's striker defense is just very very bad Shevchenko is extremely technical an absolute sniper she is likely to light Andrade up very bad and make Andrade pay uh, you know for that bad defense but you know, we haven't spoken about how these girls match up when it comes to grappling. And I do think grappling is one area where Jessica Andrade can cause Shevchenko a big problem. You know, I do think it's going to be a lot more difficult for Andrade to outmuscle Shevchenko like she's outmuscled strawweights. But we've got to remember Andrade did start life in the UFC as a bantamweight, and we've heard Rose say, you know, Andrade is, is just very, you know, built very, very differently. Shevchenko's ground game is a little bit sketchy. What you find with Shevchenko is that she looks absolutely phenomenal on the ground. Very strong, very explosive, very, very powerful. But when you see Shevchenko's ground game, a lot of the work that she does on the ground is done with raw athleticism. Her technique's okay, but it's not great. And we've seen this exploited at times with mistakes that she's made on the ground against some past opponents. We saw Jennifer Meyer able to take her down and control her for a good period of time in her last fight. You know, we saw her slip and slide and, and look very, very sloppy on the ground against Amanda Nunes back in 2017. But the problem is, since that Amanda Nunes fight, for the most part, we haven't really seen Shevchenko face any strong grapplers that have been able to make her pay for those weaknesses on the ground, right? We haven't seen any fighters skilled enough to exploit Shevchenko's weaknesses on the ground. We know Kachera at very low level, and Jacek a striker, Jessica I a striker, Karmouche very passive, didn't really work that hard to get the fight to the ground. Chukajan, you know, primarily a striker, didn't have the physicality to take Shevchenko down, and of course, Maya has also got a base in Muay Thai. So what's very, very interesting about this fight is Jessica Andrade will be the strongest grappler that Valentina Shevchenko has faced in a really, really long time. And even though, you know, we acknowledge it's not going to be as easy for Andrade to use her physicality in the flyweight division as it was in the strawweight division, I do think she poses a significant risk to Shevchenko on the ground. 
it's going to be very, very difficult for Shevchenko to take Andrade down and hold her down, which is notable because when Shevchenko does get into trouble in fights, she likes to alleviate that pressure with takedowns and take the sting out of her opponent's tail with a bit of top control. I don't think that's going to be an option for her against Andrade. I think if Shevchenko does take Andrade down, because Andrade has got that real small compact frame that's difficult to control Andrade is likely to be able to pop back up to her feet pretty quickly and I think if Andrade does get the fight to the ground with how weak Shevchenko has looked on the ground against Jennifer Maya and Amanda Nunes I do think Andrade could have quite a lot of success on the ground based on what I've seen so with this fight obviously I lean towards Valentina Shevchenko right it's complete common sense you'd have to be crazy to lean towards Andrade here with how bad she is defensively and how bad you know how dangerous Shevchenko is standing. However, there are things Andrade can do to cause Shevchenko a problem. Most noticeably, I do think the ground game of Shevchenko is an area of weakness that Andrade may be able to exploit. So with Shevchenko being such a big favourite, I'm not going to be betting her. But at the same time, I don't want to bet on Andrade either because I'm not seeing enough from her to want to take that gamble because it's a very high-risk bet. So this is a pass from me, but I do think this fight could get interesting. At the same time, with how bad Andrade is defensively, I could also see Andrade, you know, absolutely KO in her dead, uh, KO in her dead, you know, within a couple of minutes. Andrade will be a sitting duck to the KO. So um, I hope you found that useful. Now let's take a look at the fight between Wei Lei Zhang and Rose Namajunas. Great fight this. Probably the best fight on the main card. Definitely the best fight out of the title fights. And I do think this, this matchup is likely to be very competitive. But at the same time, I do hate breaking down fights like this on YouTube. Just because every once in a while you get these fighters come along which just attract kind of like a, a tribalism fandom where... Fans of a certain fighter feel so passionately about a fighter's skill set that if you disagree with their opinions or you kind of suggest things about the fighter that you know could be weaknesses, they really, really don't like it and they defend their fighter quite vociferously. Unfortunately, Wei Lei Zhang is one of those fighters. Ultimately, it's my job to try and put my money in strong positions every week and make as much money from betting on MMA as I can. So when I look at any fighter, it doesn't matter if it's Hannah Cyphers or Wei Lei Zhang or it doesn't matter if it's Israel Adesanya, Robert Whittaker. It doesn't matter who it is. Could be Paige Van Zandt and Brittenhart in BKFC. All I'm trying to do is study the footage and make the best decision possible with the information we've got available. So I think a lot of the time when people watch my breakdown videos, they think I'm some kind of like biased fan or something. But honestly, genuinely and completely, I don't have any bias towards any fighter. I don't really, I'm not a fan of any fighter. My main goal is just to make money and I care a lot more about that than any fighter. So... Please, if you feel very, very passionately about this fight between Rose Namajunas and Wei Lei Zhang, just know that I'm coming at you here and breaking this fight down from a betting point of view, from a perspective of someone that spent quite a lot of time studying this matchup. And all I'm really doing is relaying what I found in my research. And to that point, you know, you, you can be sure that with the amount of depth that I go into in these videos, I'm not someone that is, you know, giving you an opinion based on hazy memories. I'm not someone that's just kind of scanning through wikipedia and forming an opinion based on you know tiny little pockets of information they remember from watching fights two three years ago you know last night i actually spent two to three hours studying a lot of zhang's recent matchups a lot of namajunas's matchups so that when i present this information to you it is a pretty high degree of accuracy to the point where you know personally when i look at you know capping fights and breaking down fights from a betting point of view I, I believe a lot of the stuff that I'm kind of communicating to you guys is, is for the most part, fact. To the point where, you know, if you open the window and you ask me what colour is the grass, I'm going to tell you it's green. Just like if I evaluate a Rose Namajunas fight, I feel I could pretty accurately describe to you her strengths and weaknesses. I could do the same for Zhang. And I could give a pretty good explanation based on those strengths and weaknesses, how both fighters are going to match up when they face each other. You know, that doesn't mean I can predict who's going to win but it does mean that you know we can work out probably by the betting odds which fighter has the best risk to reward ratio and that's really the goal of this breakdown so i want to make that very clear because 
when you have a matchup like Rose Namajunas and Weile Zhang, I find that people do get very tribal and they 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 set up shop in two different camps. You'll have the fighter that will that you know you have the individual that will say there's absolutely no way Rose Namajunas can win this fight. Weile Zhang is too tough too powerful and Namajunas is not going to be able to deal with the power of Zhang there's just no chance and then there's the other camp of people that will be like Rose is too fast too skilled Zhang's not going to be able to deal with his speed you know if Namajunas takes the fight to the ground Zhang is screwed you know Namajunas is going to win 100% and the problem is with that mindset and I see a lot of people with this mindset you know in MMA betting and even in you know betting other sports the problem is that kind of mindset will get you into trouble because you've got to be radically open-minded to all possibilities. The goal of making money you know, from any type of gambling is to look at all possible scenarios, try and work out what the most likely scenarios are, try and assign a probability to what each of those likely scenarios are, then look at the implied probability in the betting odds to see if there's any opportunity to get a good risk to reward on betting either fighter. And that brings me on to getting into this matchup because it's very, 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 very important to remember no matter who you feel will win this fight, ultimately, you have to look at the betting odds to consider if you're getting a good risk to reward for your money. So earlier on in the video, we spoke about how Jim Crute was, you know, in that odds range of about 1.50. And so, you know, with his odds commanding an implied probability in that 66% range, Crute had to have basically no major weaknesses in order to find value there. If we take a look at the odds on Wei Lei Zhang, we can see it's pretty much the same story. She is currently around about an average of 1.47, which is minus 213 for an implied probability of 68%. So to get any value in Wei Lei Zhang, you've got to give her a better than 68% chance of winning. So based on that, she shouldn't really have any major weaknesses here that Rose can exploit because you're already paying a pretty steep price on Zhang. Uh, you're not getting a great risk to reward ratio. You know, by putting up $100, you're only winning 47 back. You'd want Zhang to be a pretty safe bet here to, to be getting a good deal for your money. If we take a look at the odds on Rose Namajunas, her current average odds are about 2.75, which is plus 175 for an implied probability of 36%. So obviously when you're working with a fighter in that odds range, you've got a lot more room to get a better risk to reward ratio, right? A fighter in that odds range can have a lot more weaknesses and you can still get a good deal because obviously when you're putting up $100 to win $175 back, you don't need to win as many of these bets over the long term to still grind out a profit, whereas there's not really much room for error with Zhang. You know, if Zhang were to, you know, get disqualified or, you know, lose a close decision or injure herself in the fight or get flash knocked out by Namajunas, you know, it's quite unforgiving betting fighters in this odd range. So how do these two fighters match up from a stylistic point of view? What I would say about Zhang is there's a lot to like about Zhang, but I also feel that there are a lot of weaknesses that can be exploited. She's got a very impressive record at 21-1. and 1. However, her record is super padded. If you look at her record... You know, she has fought a lot of opponents, you know, in, 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 you know, in a small regional promotion in China, Kunlun Fight. And she doesn't have that much experience competing against a high level of opponent. Now, obviously, she has fought high level opponents in the UFC, going up against Tisha Torres, Jessica Andraj, and Joanna and Jacek back to back. Definitely no picnic. Those are two, you know, those are three really tough opponents. But in the Tisha Torres and Joanna and Jacek fights, we have seen weaknesses in Zhang that suggest she isn't as uh, she isn't as great as I think people think she is. For whatever reason, every once in a while, we get fighters come along with a crazy amount of hype behind them. You know, fighters like uh, you know we've had fighters like Macy Barber, Johnny Walker, Vulcan Uzdemir. Um, you know, fighters like this, and straight away, just after a few, you know. In a few exciting fights or you know a few exciting finishes people are completely sold on these fighters straight away and they you know put them on a pedestal and they really overestimate their skill set in a big way and i feel something similar is happening with zhang there are a lot of things zhang does well but if you sit down in the cold light of day without any bias and watch her performances against tisha torres and joanna and jacek you'll see a lot of areas in this matchup that rose can have a lot of success let's talk you through them so starting off with the Tisha Torres fight was very interesting about the uh, you know the Wei Lei Zhang versus Joanna and Jacek matchup was that 
Zhang and Yin Jacek both landed an insane amount of strikes, right? I think they broke uh, the record for most strikes landed in a title fight at the time. It was insane. Both girls stood right in front of each other in that Rock'em Sock'em Robots range and literally just threw down. It was nuts. But if you go and watch Wei Lei Zhang's fight against Tisha Torres, she didn't have anywhere near as much success landing. Now, you could say that was because there was a year's gap in between those two fights. So perhaps, you know, Wei Lei Zhang improved a lot in that 12 months. But I think it's got a lot more to do with Yun Jacek's approach to that fight, which made the, the kind of striking exchanges a lot easier for Zhang to have success in. If you look at the difference between Yun Jacek and Torres' is striking, there's no doubt that Yun Jacek is a better striker than Torres, but styles make fights. And Yun Jacek comes from that Muay Thai base, right? And what do we know about Muay Thai fighters? They like to stand right in front of you and pick you off. You know, Yun Jacek likes to stand right in front of her opponent and use her superior speed and technique to pick her opponent apart. That's exactly what we saw her do to Wei Lei Zhang. Both girls stood right in front of each other and just exchanged bombs for the entire fight. Neither girl really liked to take too much of a backward step, but Yun Jacek very much fought in a range, in that close boxing range, where Zhang, every time she opened up, Yun Jacek was there to be hit. It's very different to the style of striking we saw from Zhang against Tisha Torres because Tisha Torres comes from a base in Taekwondo. She's a black belt in Taekwondo, and of course, what is the style of striking Taekwondo is based on? It's point fighting, right? Hit and not be hit. So Torres has got this style of striking where she's either all the way out of a range where she can be hit or all the way in on the inside, usually throwing you know, blitzing attacks. If you go back and watch that matchup, Zhang didn't have anywhere near as much success landing. And I think a big reason for that is that Zhang's footwork and mobility is not great. We talk a lot about how powerful she is, how explosive she is, but that comes at a cost in that she is quite flat, she is quite heavy set. And so if you're stood right in front of her and she catches you, you know, with one of those big hooks that she loads up on, she's going to hurt you. But if you don't stand right in front of her, if you maintain a safe distance and you have, you know, uh, you, know uh, you know, stay light on your feet, you're a little bit more elusive. I don't think Zhang's got the pressure fighting style or the footwork to really do a particularly good job of, uh, of cutting the cage off and landing on an opponent that refuses to stand right in front of her. We very much saw that in the Tisha Torres fight. What's very notable about that is that Tisha Torres is a back belt in Taekwondo and what style of striking is Namajunas' uh, striking based on is Taekwondo, right? Namajunas has a base in Taekwondo. So that's an interesting detail to pay attention to. One of the biggest weaknesses that I've seen with Zhang when it comes to her striking is that her boxing defense is very, very bad. She is a bit of a sitting duck. She doesn't move her head very much. And that's because she has a tremendous amount of faith in her chin and toughness. And I don't blame her. She's incredibly tough, incredibly powerful, and hits very, very hard. So, you know, these two girls have got very different styles. Rose likes to stay very light on her feet and use a lot of movement to evade getting hit. Whereas Zhang is waiting for you to come forward, waiting to get into a range where you're going to, you know, open up and, and, and look to attack her so that she can plant her feet and fire back with her big counters. And she's betting on her chin against yours and hoping that she catches you with something big as you come in. And that's why she had so much success against Yun Jacek because Yun, Yun Jacek was happy to play in that close range and why she struggled a little bit against Torres because Torres wasn't willing to play that game. What's interesting about this fight is that Namajunas has that very in and out style. You know, she's looking to use her speed and technique and her footwork to kind of pick you off from a range where it's difficult for you to counter her. And I think that makes this a uh, potentially tricky fight for Zhang standing because Zhang is going to be looking to load up in that phone booth range with those big winging hooks. And I think for the most part, Namajunas isn't going to be there. What is very, very notable to me as well about the Joanna and Jacek fight is that Zhang became significantly flatter as the fight went on. If you go, want, go and watch it back in the cold light of day, you can see that by the end of the second round, Zhang was breathing quite heavy and her hand speed, you know, had fallen off a cliff. She was looking pretty sloppy, a lot sloppier than she was in round one. In round one, she was moving very well, looking very, very sharp. But past that second round into the third and the fourth and the fifth, Zhang was looking pretty flat. Now, a huge tactical error that Joanna Yunjacek made in this fight 
was that even when Zhang started to look very flat, she still decided to fight her in that phone booth range, and that just enabled Zhang to rack up volume, have success, to sh sheer grit, determination. She hits hard, right? Yin Jacek more of a volume striker, so when Yin Jacek was landing, didn't look like it was doing as much damage to Zhang as when Zhang was landing and backing Yin Jacek up. And, 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 you know, the perception was she was doing a lot more damage to Yin Jacek, but if you actually look at you know, those exchanges and how flat Zhang looked. You know, I think uh, the only reason Zhang had so much success is because Yin Jacek stood right in front of her. If Yin Jacek would have been a little bit more elusive, moved around a little bit more, I really think Zhang would have struggled. And what's very, very notable to me is if you go and watch the Weilei Zhang versus Joanna Yin Jacek fight and the Rose Namajunas versus Yin Jacek fight, the second one, if you watch them back to back, you will see Zhang looking very flat and very sloppy in rounds 3, 4, and 5. Whereas Rose looks pretty sharp still in rounds 3, 4, and 5 against Yin Jacek. She's difficult to hit, light on her feet, still very accurate, still very fast. And so, you know, I do think there's a lot of danger for Rose early in this fight. You know, I think early on, she definitely doesn't want to be in clean, hard punches from Zhang. Zhang's an absolute powerhouse. But I think if this fight goes into the 3rd, 4th, and 5th, with how flat Zhang looked late on against Yin Jacek, I think she's really going to struggle against Rose because Rose isn't going to stay in front of her and play rock and sock and robots like Yin Jacek did. So it's an interesting fight when it comes to striking because Zhang definitely has the power to hurt Nama Juna. She's got that grit, that determination, that toughness, but I'm not convinced she has the technical ability to back it up. Certainly not on the same level as Nama Junis when it comes to technique. And it is possible. It is possible that Nama Junis could style on Zhang here and, um, you know, pick her apart. It's possible. So when it comes to striking, I think both girls do things that can cause the other a problem. Zhang's definitely going to be the more powerful, physically imposing fighter here. Zhang, you know, Nama Junis is much more feminine, much more slight. She relies much more on technique as opposed to that raw strength and power and athleticism that Zhang's got. So both girls have got areas that they can cause the other a problem when it comes to striking. But on the ground is where things get super interesting. I'm very, very, very confident that Nama Junis is several levels above Weile Zhang on the ground. If you go back and watch Weile Zhang's fight against Tisha Torres, you can see her make a lot of mistakes on the ground. She frequently gives up position. Her top game doesn't look that heavy. And generally speaking, she's very, very sloppy. We know Nama Junis is an absolute ninja on the ground. Very unorthodox. She can jump on nasty submissions very, very quickly. And she can also inflict quite a lot of damage from top position with her ground and pound and elbows. If this fight goes to the ground, I think Zhang is going to be in a lot of trouble. Now, I don't think Nama Junis is necessarily going to use grappling in this fight because I think Nama Junis is one of these fighters that needs to fight smart in order to pace herself over 25 minutes. And when Nama Junis does use grappling, she does have a tendency to you know, gas herself out quite quickly. So I don't think Nama Junis is going to actively look to get this fight to the ground. But if the fight does go to the ground, you know, maybe Zhang looks to take Nama Junis down in a moment of madness. Or, you know, maybe there's a knockdown and they end up in a crazy scramble on the ground. I honestly think Nama Junis gives Zhang absolute hell on the ground. And uh, that's definitely one area, uh, undeniably, that Nama Junis is going to have a pretty huge advantage. However, you know, if Nama Junis does use a lot of grappling early on, that could backfire because she risks burning herself out and then struggling against Zhang, you know, in the third, fourth, and fifth round. Because one thing I've got to say about Zhang, which is, you know, it, it's a huge, you know, it, it's a huge pro. You know, it, it's absolutely great is, even though Zhang looked tired and flat from the second round onwards against Joanna and Jacek, she is one of these fighters that because she's so strong, she's got that warrior spirit, because she's so tough, even when she's tired, she's still dangerous and she's still game as hell. I feel that's different. When Ram Rose Namajunas gets tired, she te tends to fade and check out mentally. That's a big difference from both girls. If this fight turns into a war, there's absolutely no doubt that you know that favours Zhang. So that's how these guys, uh, that, that's how these girls kind of match up from a stylistic point of view. Um, there are a couple of X factors at play in this matchup, which I do think are pretty significant. The first one being that this is Weile Zhang's first fight back after an absolute war against Yoanna Yun Jacek. Like I say, both Yun Jacek and Zhang took tons of damage in that matchup. Zhang was badly rocked at the end of the second round. And we know that, you know, Yun Jacek's forehead looked like something out of a horror movie. It was insane. 
Now, I do like that Zhang has taken a year off from that fight to recover. So, she's given her body more than enough time to heal up and recover. However, we have seen, you know, over the years how these five-round wars can have a lasting impact on a fighter's performance. You know, we know that these big five-round wars take their toll on a fighter. And sometimes fighters never recover from these five-round wars. Zhang, you know, is quite young in her career. She's 31 years old. But she has had 22 pro fights. I'm not familiar with how much damage she's taken throughout her career because obviously a lot of her fights have taken place outside the UFC. But that was a big amount of damage she took against Jin Jacek and we don't really know how she's going to bounce back from that. Rose Namajunas also has her own issues though because against Jessica Andrade, she had her nose absolutely crushed by Jessica Andrade and in the third round was hanging on for her life. Had that been a five-round fight... Namajunas almost definitely would have lost and obviously it was a pretty bad nose break it would have been very painful for Namajunas the recovery would have been very debilitating and so let's listen to Rose herself talk about the road back from that nose injury let's listen to what she's got to say uh, wanted to go back several months post your last fight against Jessica Andrade uh, you had to get nose surgery right you broke your nose uh, first off how did that go how was the recovery and, and do you feel like it's fully recovered at this point? Yeah, that was probably the most uncomfortable week of my life <laughs> as far as, um, you know, having those tubes up my nose. And uh, there was like a moment where I decided to, you know, oh, I'm going to just skip one of the doses of the pain meds. And man, that's all the pain just went into my head and it was terrible. Um, and then, yeah, back on the pain meds. And it was just a week of uncomfortable, uh, just yeah, not be, really being able to sleep. And then you know, the weeks after that, it just kept getting better and better. But man, those tubes, like, yeah, the most uncomfortable thing ever. And and you broke your nose in the fight against Andrade, right? Yeah, but um, my nose actually, my, my septum was deviated for like seven years. And it's something that I've been like, you know, kind of was going to wait till after fighting to fix. But it just so happened that in the fight, um, the actual, you know, the nose, broke in four places so it was just like why not get it fixed now and now I can I uh I don't have any like sinus problems anymore even like my neck problems seem to be better from you know just not having those sinus issues and um I can breathe way better than I've than I've been able to in the past seven years so it's like it's kind of a blessing and and how long after the surgery did it take for you to feel like all right I feel comfortable getting punched in the face um, I think it was about like, what, three months. Yeah. Okay. And so now like mentally, no limitations, like you're comfortable with it. Yeah. And even after three months, there was like a period of like, oh, you know, like I would definitely do everything I could to like avoid it at all costs. And I still do to this day, you know, obviously nobody wants to get punched, but, um, but there was a moment where I got like the, I remember one of the first days where it kind of like I bumped it or somebody threw like a punch and then, uh, you know, it, it felt a little weird because the first time getting punched again, but then I was like, oh, everything's fine. You know, <laughs> I'm good. So uh, ever since that day, it's just been now, now I don't even think about it. So you, you had the fight in uh, July, then you get the note. So this is a big, big, big red flag for me. And this is why when we break these fights down from a betting point of view, I'll be perfectly honest with you. What I really love about my website and my community is it's a very mature community and we can discuss these fights from a very mature perspective with no bias. We've talked about a lot of the weaknesses Zhang has that Namajunas can exploit, but we have to talk about Namajunas' weakness as well. When we look at both these girls and the damage that they're dealing with coming back into this matchup, we look at Wei Lei Zhang and... She could have taken a life-changing amount of damage against Jin Jacek. You know, we've never seen her hurt like that. We've never seen her take that much damage. We don't know what the re rehabilitation for Zhang was like after that. Yes, yeah, she's tough. She's an absolute warrior. But we don't know if she was dealing with concussion symptoms for, you know, six to eight weeks after that fight. You know, we don't know what kind of lasting, you know, health impact she, she you know, she had to suffer with from that matchup. But we can't ignore the fact that Rose Namajunas broke her nose real bad against Jessica Andrade. And we've seen how significant nose injuries can be. Look at Rory McDonald. After he broke his nose against Robbie Lawler, Rory McDonald was never the same fighter again. I think a big part of the decline we're seeing in Mike Perry is 
the broken nose that he suffered against Vicente Luque. Since Mike Perry broke his nose against Vicente Luque, he just hasn't looked anywhere near as sharp. And so this is a huge red flag with Namajunas that she's kind of acknowledging that, you know, if it, it, it took a while for her to get comfortable being hit again after breaking her nose. And in the interview with Ariel, she's saying everything's fine now. And I'm sure in her head it is, you know, in training against regular sparring partners in a comfortable, familiar surrounding. But there's a big difference between getting comfortable being hit in the nose that was hurt so badly and had such a grueling rehabilitation before, you know, in, in very comfortable surroundings in the training room compared to getting, you know, tagged in the nose by an absolute beast like Wei Lei Zhang that's going to be swinging for the fences, loading up on big power punches and looking to hurt Rose very, very bad. So when you hear Rose talk about like that, you know, she is describing the exact reason why it's very, very dangerous to bet on a fighter in this first fight back after, you know, suffering a bad injury or a bad knockout. Because we really not we, we don't know how they're going to bounce back and recover. And, you know, sometimes they never bounce back and recover. Sometimes it takes them a long time to get that confidence back. And like I say, sometimes they never get it back. But this is the first fight we've seen, you know, from both these girls since they've uh, they, they've suffered quite a lot of damage. But I do like how they've both taken quite a lot of time off. A year for Zhang and, uh, you know, it's going to be going to be about eight or nine months for Namajuna. So that's pretty good. So let's bring this back full circle and summarize where we are based on everything we've seen. So when you look at how these girls match up from a stylistic point of view, I believe there are a lot of things Zhang does which can cause Namajuna a problem. But I also believe there's a lot of things that Namajuna can do to cause Zhang a problem. In that type of situation, the underdog always becomes very interesting to me because you're getting a pretty good risk to reward ratio, betting a big underdog in a fight that could go either way. If the fight stays standing, I think Namajunas may struggle to deal with Zhang's power early, but I think the longer it goes, the more predictable and sloppy Zhang becomes, the more Namajunas is going to be able to foot, use her footwork, her longer style of fighting, her technique to start to pick Zhang apart. And of course, if it goes to the ground, I think Namajunas can give... Uh, Zhang absolute hell so when I look at this fight from a betting point of view you know we've currently got Zhang at odds of about 1.47 which is minus 213 for an implied probability of 68 percent there's no way that I can bet Zhang here nothing against Zhang but I can't touch her here for the same reasons I couldn't bet Jim Crute Jim Crute has significant weaknesses that Anthony Smith can exploit and Zhang has significant weaknesses that Namajunas can exploit there's no amount of footage you can show me which will, you know, make me see otherwise. That's just the way it is. That's the facts if you watch Zhang's past fights. So when we look at Namajunas, I definitely think Namajunas is worth a small bet here. Our odds are 2.75 plus 175. We know that her taekwondo-based distance-style striking could, could give Zhang a problem. We also know that if the fight goes to the ground, you know, Namajunas is likely to cause Zhang Zhang big, big, big trouble. And on top of that... We also know that, you know, Zhang is very, very bad defensively. You know, she took a lot of damage against Jen Jacek. She's one of these fighters that will not take a backward step. She waits for you to attack her so that she can plant her feet, stand her ground and fire back with big hooks. But Namajunas is much less likely to play that game than Jen Jacek. And that distant style of striking, you know, hit and you know, hit your opponent and not getting hit, you know, get in and out. It's, it, it could cause Zhang big trouble. So I am going to bet on Namajunas pretty small this weekend. Uh, nothing big from me. Uh, I do think this is definitely a dog or pass fight though. And something that's very, very notable to me with this matchup was that if you go to uh, my YouTube channel, I uploaded the live stream research session for this fight. Um, and 100 people watched that live stream research session. These research sessions are really useful because we have that wisdom of crowds advantage where a lot of eyeballs are watching the footage and researching the matchup together and so there's a lot of a, a lot of benefit to the group think where at the end of the session we say right guys after everything that we've watched here out of all the footage we studied who do you think is the better bet which fighter do you think has the best risk to reward ratio and in recent weeks in the you know Nina Nunes versus Mackenzie Dern session you know the overwhelming majority has gone with Mackenzie Dern Mackenzie Dern ends up winning. The group isn't always going to be right. 
but there's been situations over the last few months where when you have an overwhelmingly large number of people leaning towards one fighter, it does tend to be the right side to be on. Last weekend is a very good example. We researched the fight between Robert Whittaker and Kelvin Gastelum as a group on stream. Literally every single person in the stream leaned towards Whittaker based on what we saw in the footage and Whittaker obviously looked fantastic. This week at the end of this four hour long research session when I asked the group, who do you lean towards? Who is the better risk to reward ratio here? I would say 80% of people watching that live stream lean towards Namajunas. It's very, very telling for me. That doesn't mean Namajunas is going to win this weekend. There are things Zhang can do to cause her a big problem. But, you know, when you look at the odds on both fighters, if I've got to put up $100 on this fight and bet either girl, do I want to put $100 on Zhang to win 47 or $100 on Namajunas to win 175 Both girls have got very credible pass to victory for me. It's got to be Namajunas all day long, dog or pass. So it is a risky bet, but I do like these situations where, you know, a fight is likely to be competitive and you can, you know, you could bet one of the fighters in a competitive matchup at reasonably big underdog odds. So I do like Rose here. And uh, yeah, let me know what you think in the comments below. I know it's one of those fights where, you know, people feel very strongly about it. And I don't honestly understand why. I really don't. It, when when we break these fights down, a lot of the time, it's almost like I'm insulting someone's sister. All I'm doing is, you know, watching past fights and you know, sharing with, with you know with you guys what I've seen while watching past fights. And you know, watching past fights, I think Rose a pretty good bet this weekend. We'll see what happens. Okay, let's talk about the fight between Kamaru Usman and Jorge Masvidal. So obviously, this is a rematch. Usman and Masvidal have fought in the past. Classic striker versus grappler matchup. Usman, the grappler. Masvidal, the striker. We know what both of these guys are probably going to want to try and do. Usman's probably going to want to get this fight into the clinch where he can neutralize Masvidal's striking and drag him to the ground. Masvidal is going to want to try and keep the fight standing so he can exercise his boxing advantage. So if we look at the odds on this fight, Usman currently around about a 1.24 favorite which is minus 417 for an implied probability of 81%. And if we take a look at the odds on Jorge Masvidal, currently around about an average of 4.25, which is plus 325 for an implied probability of 24%. Very interesting matchup because we've seen these guys fight pretty recently and it was a relatively dominant performance from Usman right we didn't really see him in any trouble there was nothing Masvidal did which caused Usman you know any problem really Usman was able to drive Masvidal into the cage wear on him in the clinch and even when the fight was in kickboxing range Masvidal didn't trouble Usman you know he didn't look that dangerous but it is fair to say Masvidal did step up and take that fight on six days notice and to be honest with you I don't think either guy looked particularly good in that matchup Masvidal looked very flat didn't really have any pop in his shots you know didn't have that same you know kind of sharpness that we see from him and Usman also looked quite a bit flatter I don't think Usman looked anywhere near as physically imposing as he had against Gilbert Burns Colby Covington or Tyron Woodley and Usman acknowledged this himself by saying that it really threw him off you know, having an opponent switch six days before a title fight. You know, he was training and planning to fight Gilbert Burns, who's obviously got a very difficult, uh, or a very different style to Masvidal, right? So this is an interesting rematch because, to be honest with you, I don't see a lot changing from their first fight. I bet Usman in the first fight at odds were around 1.44 minus 227. And while I would expect... A better version of Masvidal to show up and a better version of Kamaru Usman to show up. I don't think that's going to change the outcome. When we look at the size between these two, diff- you know, these two fighters, Masvidal previously fought at lightweight. He's five foot eleven with a seventy-three inch reach. Usman is a welterweight, but he's an absolutely huge welterweight, six foot tall with a seventy-seven and a half inch reach. And the thing about Usman is he's a very strong physically imposing fighter so we've got Masvidal you know coming up from lightweight to the welterweight division facing one of the biggest welterweights in the division and that size and physicality is one of Usman's biggest weapons he can use his long wind span you know his long arms to wrap his arms around his opponent's body and control him off that body lock force him to carry his body weight and wear them down that's something he had a lot of success doing in the first matchup so 
it's a very, very difficult stylistic matchup for Masvidal because we've seen that throughout Masvidal's career, takedowns and the ground game have been his weakness. Usman smothered him in pressure in their last fight. We saw Damian Meyer take Masvidal down and have quite a lot of success controlling him on the ground. And we did also see, you know, Masvidal look quite weak off his back against Meyer. Now, I know Meyer is an elite Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, very high-level grappler. But so is Usman. Usman's a very physically imposing grappler, heavy top game, and he's absolutely huge. If Maya can hold a guy like Masvidal down, you bet your ass Usman can hold him down as well. And so this isn't that interesting a fight. You know, I see a lot more talk this week about the matchup between Zhang and Namajunas. It's not that interesting a fight simply because we've seen it play out before. And if anything, I think Usman has made exponential improvements and got even better since they last fought. You know, since Kamaru Usman has gone to train with Trevor Whitman, we've seen his striking improve tremendously. You know, the jab of Usman now was never there before. It wasn't really there the last time he fought Masvidal. And Usman has spoken himself about the work that he's put in with Trevor Whitman and how Trevor Whitman has helped him develop this jab. And now that jab makes it much easier for Usman to defend himself standing, but also set up his takedowns. So, you know, in the past, you'd only really have to worry about Usman's grappling and he wouldn't really be able to pose much of a threat to you striking, whereas now you've got his striking and his grappling to worry about. The one thing I would say, though, about Usman and the, the, the tiny glimmer of hope that exists here for Masvidal is that we do see a strange phenomenon play out with grapplers from time to time. And it's something that Khabib has spoken about quite a lot. Khabib has said that a big mistake that wrestlers make in their MMA careers is that they try to be strikers. And Khabib said it's a huge mistake because you spend your whole life developing you know a high level grappling skill set and then when you try a kickbox as a grappler you're not going to be on that same level and so you're more vulnerable and it gives your opponent more ways to win i do worry about that with usman it's quite clear now that he's training under a predominantly striking based coach in trevor whitman that he is falling in love with his striking and we're seeing usman use more and more striking in each of his fights which isn't a bad thing because it's just you know a sign of that development that progression that improvement and Usman becoming a more complete fighter but at the same time we have seen it get him into trouble recently you know we've seen him get dropped by Gilbert Burns he was wobbled a couple of times in the Colby Covington fight and I think it's fair to say Masvidal is just as dangerous as Burns and certainly more dangerous standing than Colby Covington so what I worry about Kamaru, what what I worry about with Kamaru Usman is there's so much bad blood coming into this fight. Usman always wants to come in and make a statement, and I worry that he's going to want to come in, showcase some of the tremendous striking skills that he's been working on and and, and improving under Trevor Whitman, and uh, you know eat something crazy and get himself knocked out. Now it's not that likely, right? Let's be real. Masvidal's dangerous standing. But throughout Masvidal's career, aside from the odd knockout here and there against Darren Till, Masvidal's not one of these guys that has ever really shown legit one-shot KO power. Masvidal's more of a volume striker that wears you down. And even when we've seen Usman get dropped by Gilbert Burns or wobbled by Colby Covington, he has shown a tremendous ability to recover very, very quickly. As soon as you hurt Usman, straight away he recovers, gets his head, head back in the game, and, you know, he's the Nigerian nightmare once again. You know, he, he recovers almost immediately. And, of course, on top of that, he's had 19 pro fights and he's never been knocked out. So the probability of Masvidal knocking Usman out isn't that likely. However, like I say, Usman is starting to use his striking more and more. He got dropped by Burns. He's wobbled a couple times by Colby Covington. And the more he chooses to stand and strike, the more he'll put himself at risk of, of getting hurt bad and knocked out. One of the major reasons why Usman has never been knocked out is because very few fighters that Usman has faced have been able to stop his wrestling. And so for the most part, Usman was never in a range to be knocked out, right? He's always driving his opponents into the clinch, taking him down, wearing on him in the clinch or on the ground. Now that we're starting to see Usman, you know, spend more time in that kickboxing range, he will be more vulnerable to the knockout. And it is notable to me how he was dropped by Gilbert Burns. But... Having said that, Usman's an absolute nightmare. Very strong wrestler. 
We know Masvidal's takedown offense isn't great. His ground game is good, but he's not the best off his back. He's quite easy to hold down, especially for a big, strong, physically imposing guy like Kamaru Usman. And for that reason, uh, you've got to go with Usman here, right? I am not personally interested in betting Usman. Way too big of a favorite for me. Uh, but just like we said with the Valentina Shevchenko versus Jessica Andrade fight, I'm not interested in betting on uh you know andraj either because you know with masvidal i don't really see a realistic path to victory for him unless he lands something crazy and flash ko's usman but obviously i don't want to bet on uh, on that kind of variance so thank you very much for watching i hope you enjoyed that video if you did please hit the like button below and don't forget if this video gets 300 likes, I will do that prop bet live stream on Friday night. But we need those 300 likes by Friday. Saturday is too late. Got to have the old COVID jab. So thank you for watching. If you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. Would love to grow my channel bigger. And anyway, if I don't see you before next week's video, take care. Have a great weekend. I hope you crush it this weekend and make loads of money. And uh, yeah, nice one for watching. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care. Bye.